All right, you lot, and welcome back to another Football Daily XI. This week, we're looking at players that have gone from poverty to a position of power. Let's dive straight in. Goalkeeper Ali Al Habsi. Hailing from Oman, a country of 4 million people on the Arabian Peninsula, Ali Al Habsi grew up in a tiny village where temperatures could reach as much as 50 degrees in the summer. Too hot to leave the house after 10 a.m. As a child, Al Habsi and his brothers would try to knock mangoes out of trees with stones, and the keeper still has scars on his head from one poor throw. Though standing at six foot four inches, Al Habsi didn't play between the sticks until he was 16. And after school, he trained to become a fireman, never expecting to make a career out of football. But former Manchester City and Newcastle John Burridge, then a coach of the Oman national team, saw the youngster play and invited him to try out for the national squad, confidently telling Al Habsi that he'd play in the Premier League one day. Burridge was an odd guy. He apparently slept holding a football. But he was right about the stopper. At 21, Al Habsi was an international. At 35, he became the first Omani player in the EPL. And in 2013, he lifted the FA Cup with Wigan. Defender, Lorik Karna. One of the many displaced by the war in Yugoslavia, PSG, Marseille and Lazio utility man Lorik Karna was born in Pristina now the capital of Kosovo. At the time, ethnic Albanians were treated like second-class citizens, with inferior healthcare and education to the Serbian population. The Karna family got out as soon as they could. Travelling to Switzerland as political refugees, Lorik's father played for Montreux. They had to renew the papers, allowing them to stay in the country every six months, and lived in constant fear of being sent home, where civil war had turned into genocide. Karna himself earned a trial with Arsenal at 16, but was prevented from attending by visa issues. Eventually, he got the first luck of his young life, and French immigration allowed him to sign for PSG a year later. Though given the chance to represent Switzerland, he ended up winning 93 caps for Albania, a national record. Defender Dante From the city of Salvador in Bahia, also home of World Cup winner Dida and Wagner Moura, the actor you know as Pablo Escobar in Narcos. Brazilian defender Dante began his football career in the car park outside the supermarket where his mother worked. A solid centre-back, Dante struggled to catch the eye with trials, and eventually his parents told him they couldn't support him anymore and that he needed to get a real job. But Dante refused to give up. And when Mastabara, 2,200 kilometers away in the south of the country, offered him a tryout, he sold his PlayStation to pay for the one-way ticket. He ended up at top flight side Juventud, and at the age of 20, was spotted by Lille, who took him to France in 2003. He went on to win titles with Standard Liège and Bayern Munich, also lifting the Champions League trophy in 2013. Defender Yuri Zerkov Yuri Zerkov had a hard journey from Russia to Chelsea, where he played for two years, winning the title in 2010. His father was a factory worker and his mother a postwoman, but with three siblings, the family struggled to make ends meet. All six Zerkovs lived in a one-bedroom apartment, and young Yuri taught himself to play football in the alleys nearby. The family frequently couldn't afford any new clothes or even food, and in summer, Zerkov would skip football to help his parents grow vegetables for the winter months. In fact, Zerkov's first payment as a footballer came in the form of food. However, he was spotted by CSK Moscow at 20, and for the first time, could afford to have a television in his house. He won the league twice, before switching to Carlo Ancelotti's Blues in 2009 for £18 million. He has since earned over 70 caps for his nation, and now plays for powerhouse's Zenit. Right mid, Garincha. The story of Garincha, the bow-legged boy who became a superstar, is both heartwarming and tragic. The player, born Manuel Francisco dos Santos, grew up in Power Grande, a town run by a fabric corporation to provide workers for their local factory. In exchange for their labor, the residents were given food and accommodation, but had nothing of their own, unless a magical talent gave them a way out. Garincha had exactly that. Though he started working in the factory when he was 14, Garincha also played for the local football team. And at 20, he was scouted by Botafogo, for whom he'd end up playing for over 600 times. A two-time World Cup winner, the Brazilian was unable to hand his meteoric ascent. He became an alcoholic, cheated his way through two marriages, and fathered at least 14 children. Eventually, he drunkenly killed his mother-in-law when he crashed the car into a lorry, and he died before he turned 50, inevitably from cirrhosis of the liver. 
Centre midfield, Rio Mavuba. Rio Mavuba is the son of Zaire International Mofulia, who won the African Cup of Nations in 1974 and competed at that year's World Cup, lining up against Jarzinho's Brazil and Kenny Dalglish's Scotland in the group stage. Her move to Angola, the country of his mother's birth, was scuppered by civil war, and Rio's parents boarded a refugee boat to France. His mother gave birth during the voyage, and Rio's passport reads, born at sea. Rio's mother died when he was two and his father remarried, landing the young, newly minted Frenchman with 11 brothers and sisters. By 14, Rio was an orphan, but Bordeaux took him on as a trainee, handing him a Ligue 1 debut age 19. The next year, he was called up to the French national team, with his first cap for Le Bleu coming in just his 32nd match as a professional. Without his selection for the squad, Mavuba's application for citizenship might not have been approved. The defensive midfielder won 13 caps for France and played for his nation at the 2014 World Cup. While at club level, he featured more than 350 times for Lille, winning a league and cup double in 2011. Central midfield, Yaya Toure. One of the most intelligent and accomplished midfielders in the last decade, Yaya Toure often seems like he was born wearing a pair of football boots. But the Ivorian was 10 before he was able to buy his first pair, instead playing barefoot in the streets of Buake, the second largest city in his country. But Toure's talent won out. He was signed by Mimosas, the Ivory Coast's most successful club when he was just 13, and the academy was under the control of former French international Jean-Marc Gelou, who used his part ownership of Belgian side Beveren to get the Ivorian youngster into European football. Torre spent five years with Beveren, Metalurg and Olympiacos before getting a move to Monaco, where he finally drew Barcelona's attention. Four titles have followed in Spain and England, as well as the Champions League in 2009. He now earns around £11.4 million a year, more than 10,000 times the Ivorian minimum wage. Left midfield, Angel Di Maria. With a name like Angel Di Maria, you expect the lanky attacker to have been blessed as a child. But Di Maria grew up hard in Rosario, also the hometown of Leo Messi. Football ran in the family, and Di Maria's father Miguel looked set to turn pro himself, until a knee injury forced him to find work in a coal yard. Angel, along with his two sisters, started helping out with deliveries by the age of 10, at which point he'd already been playing organized football for seven years. Like Torre, he couldn't afford boots as a youngster, and when Rosario Central signed him as a kid, they paid 35 footballs for his services. Portuguese giants Benfica were quick to sign the wide man, and his first move with his newfound wealth was to buy a house for his family and to tell his father he didn't have to work anymore. Di Maria has since won titles in Portugal, Spain and France, as well as the Champions League, and his cumulative transfer fees now tot up to 179 million euros. Right wing, Diego Maradona. The mercurial Argentinian had it just like a lot of South American kids, born into a shanty town to a large family with an abundance of siblings. His family was destined to birth a host of footballers though, with Maradona and his two brothers all becoming professional footballers, with Diego reaching the very top. It wasn't easy for the Maradona family growing up in the Villa Fiorito. All seven kids shared one bedroom and the toilets were somewhat primitive. Maradona saw some growing up, quite literally. As a toddler, the future World Cup winner wandered to the toilet and fell straight in the bog full of excrement. His uncle was there to save the little one from his poo-filled hell, to which Maradona later recalled his situation as, it wasn't easy, but nothing was easy. El Diego was a product of his environment, driven to succeed through his hardship and reap the glory through his natural talents. Centre forward, Flavio Sassarato. With a name meaning Flavio the Rat Hunter, and the fact you probably haven't heard of him, you know this Brazilian forward had a rough upbringing. Flavio's resiliency saw him overcome every hardship possible to make a career in the game he loved. As a kid, he used to beg for change to buy a ticket to watch Santa Cruz for starters. Flavio was also cursed with an alcoholic father, and when he was just eight years old, his dad tried to hang him while drunk. The child was only saved by the quick action of his uncle, who arrived in time to cut him down. Flavio's dad's drinking eventually killed him, and Flavio himself was philosophical about the incident, saying he wasn't a bad father, but I could never understand why he drank so much. A bullet dodged, but he couldn't dodge them all. After winning the Copa do Brasil and two local championships with Sport Recife, Flavio ended up on loan at Timbalba in 2010 and was shot twice on leaving a nightclub. Despite being hit in the back and the leg, he was back on the field a month later and won another two local titles with Santa Cruz, the club he supported as a child. 
Left wing, Rivaldo. Ballon d'Or winner Rivaldo always looked gangly whenever he was on the ball, which may have been down to a testing childhood. Growing up in the favelas of Recife, the attacking midfielder was impoverished. So much so, he lost his teeth to malnutrition and ended up bow-legged. His route into the professional game was arduous as a result, signing for Paulistano at 16, despite the club believing he was too physically weak to succeed. As if it couldn't look any more glum for the Brazilian, his father died in a car crash a year later. Just over a decade later though, Rivaldo's trophy cabinet was full to the brim, with a World Cup, a Champions League and a Copper America being in the pick of the bunch. Rising from nothing to become the world's best player, Rivaldo is a true example of poverty to power. So we hope you enjoyed that and if you want to check out more of our videos then click here on screen. Don't forget to like and subscribe and get on our Snapchat and our Twitter.